But this morning we continue. Do people know what the series of talks we're doing? The Noble Eightfold Path, that's good, so it's very good. And uh, this morning we'll be uh, looking at uh, right action and right livelihood. And this is the fourth and fifth spoke of the Dhamma wheel. We, we've, uh, I mentioned that the Noble Eightfold Path is represented by a Dhamma wheel with eight spokes. And we're up to number three, uh, um, yeah, three and four, that's it, I think, yes. And so I'd like to just mention, uh, give a quote from the Buddha about the Noble Eightfold Path again. I try to do a different one each time I do the, a different sp aspect of the, uh, the Noble Eightfold Path. And today's is, you yourselves must strive. The Buddhas only point the way. Those meditative ones who tread the path are released from the bonds of Mara. So that's a, that's a good encouragement for us to, we have to do it for ourselves. <laughs> so this is our part of the, the uh, is to do this work, to develop the Noble eight, Eightfold Path ourselves. The Buddhas, as it says, the Buddhas only show the way. So they, all the Buddhas, we don't, the last Buddha that we had wasn't the only Buddha. The Buddha mentioned another seven at least, and sometimes they were mentioned 28. So um, they all teach the Noble Eightfold Path, and by treading this, then we can be released from the bonds of Mara. And Mara is like, sometimes represented as death, sometimes as delusion, those sorts of negative qualities of the mind in particular. So we can find freedom from that, from those things, and realize the uh, aim of the Buddhist path, which is Nibbana. So, so first of all, I think people will probably want to know what uh, right action is in terms of the Noble Eightfold Path. This morning, of course, we chanted the uh, five precepts, we, uh, you took the five precepts, and the Noble Eightfold Path incorporates the five precepts, five precepts except for one precept, and I'll ask you a question about that in a minute. <laughs> so, well, what is right action? And the Buddha says, refraining from the destruction of life, refraining from taking what is not given, refraining from sexual misconduct. And uh, also, what is right livelihood? A right livelihood, of course, is our work, you know, how we earn our living. And he says, here, the noble disciple, having given up wrong livelihood, keeps himself by right livelihood. So we'll discuss a bit more what wrong livelihood is. But he also says, and this is quite important for, uh, for all of you, is a lay follower should not engage in these five trades. What five? Trading in weapons, trading in living beings, trading in meat, trading in intoxicants, trading in poisons. A lay follower should not engage in these five trades. So that gives you an idea of what the, this uh, right action is and what right livelihood. So if nothing else from today, you'll rem hopefully remember those things. But uh, recently I was reading, uh, there's a very nice new translation of the verses of the enlightened monks or the elders, the enlightened elder monks by Ajahn Sajato. It's a very inspiring. These are like the poems, the verses that they spoke. They didn't write them, they spoke them about their experiences, often about the experiences of um, awakening, becoming enlightened. So they're very inspiring. Some of them are, are wonderful um, stories too. You get a, an idea of uh, some of the difficulties they had, you know, to, in, in order to become enlightened. But one of the, uh, uh, one of the uh, poems, as it were, is by somebody called Siloa, and that's a wonderful like a, what do you say, praise to virtue, to ethical behavior. And when I read this, I, I can see very much, this must have been his vehicle to attain awakening, was going through Sila and perfecting Sila. Because of course, in a very real way, Sila is a training of the mind too. Even though we talk about body and speech, where is it coming from? <laughs> it has to come from the mind. So he, he says, and I'm only selecting a few of them, if you want to read these verses, they're in the, uh, as I said, the uh, verses of the, what does he call it? The verses of the elders, elder monks, and there were free copies at the back. That's where I got one, actually, <laughs> from the back. It's also available on the internet from Suta Central, so you can download it. 
But uh, two of the verses I think that are very uh, important. I mean, the praise that he, he speaks is incredible, actually, and very moving. He says, virtue is the starting point and foundation, the mother at the head of all good qualities. Therefore, you should purify virtue. Virtue is a boundary and a restraint, an enjoyment for the mind, the place where all the Buddhas cross over. Therefore, you should purify virtue. Isn't that interesting, you know? How many people think of virtue as being an enjoyment for the mind? It's really interesting, isn't it? But if it's seen in the right way, of course it is, because the mind can relax, the mind can enjoy the fact not breaking the precepts, not developing negative qualities through body, speech and mind, not developing a negative karma. And I also like to put in the uh, uh, context of what the Buddha said about, uh, about sila and about our, our potential for developing you know, ethical behaviour. And this, I like this quote very much actually because it really points to uh, so much to the wisdom and the compassion of the Buddha at the same time. And he said, monks, abandon the unwholesome. It is possible to abandon the unwholesome. If it were not possible to abandon the unwholesome, I would not say, monks, abandon the unwholesome. But because it is possible to abandon the unwholesome, I say, monks, abandon the unwholesome. If this abandoning of the unwholesome led to harm and suffering, I would not tell you to abandon it. But because the abandoning of the unwholesome leads to welfare and happiness, I say, monks, abandon the unwholesome. So it's very nice, isn't it? It's really, it's, uh, it's pointing out that it is possible <laughs> to abandon the unwholesome. Many people often think, you know, they have, have an idea that these qualities, you know, positive and negative qualities, are sort of inherent, they're natural. You can't do much with them. You can work with them, you know. The only, the only, some of the major things that people work on, of course, are anger and those sorts of negative qualities, and they try to reduce those. But often they're seen as inherent qualities, and for a very, very good reason that people see, identify them with them, don't they? I am an angry person. I am a depressed person. I am a confused person. I am a greedy person or a lustful person or whatever, we, we identify with them. So if the idea of that they can be abandoned or could be reduced is actually hitting at our attachment to them in many ways. So that's a, it's a, one of the possibilities for why uh, you know, people think that it's perhaps not possible to do much about our inequalities. But the most important thing about uh, the uh, the right action, and this is the seal of the ethical behaviour, is that it protects us. And that's a big point. And what does it protect us against? Well, first of all, I would say anybody can look around and see if you break any of the five precepts, it can lead to trouble here and now, <laughs> just, just in our lives. Killing living beings, particularly if it's a human being, that will lead to immediate problems with the law and difficulties in life. If we take what's not given, that can also lead to problems. Even if it's even things like uh, tax evasion, isn't it? They, eventually they can catch up with one. And the same with sexual misconduct, conduct actually is, a real, is one that most people can see really easily. The consequences here and now in our lives can be devastating and lead to break up of families, can even lead to people killing each other, you know, that sort of thing. And of course, lying has, uh, has consequences here and now that can uh, lead us to, um, you know, court cases, to jail, these sorts of things. And also, the thing that happens, of course, with lying is people tend to distrust a person whose word they can't trust. So uh, naturally, that has consequences. But what the Buddha is thinking of, that is karma too. That is karma. That's the sort of karma that ripens here and now. And, but there's also the Buddha's concern with the karma that ripens in the future, you know, in, in future lives. And, you know, sometimes people think that we, we, they may get away with it in this life, you know, but in actual fact, the law of karma, what the Buddha was speaking about, means that it catches up with us. We don't get away with it at all. But we can, of course, uh, you know, reduce negative karma that we've created by doing good karma. And uh, that's the... That's the, uh, the way we can affect it. 
And there's a very good story I like actually that uh, Ajahn Brahm uh, used to tell. And this is uh, about some monks who went to a dana. Often we go to danas in houses or in uh, restaurants sometimes for people who want their houses or restaurants blessed. And some monks went one time and there was an aquarium, a large aquarium with fish in it. And some of the monks said, oh, what a shame, look at these fish, they can't, they, you know, they're not in nature, they're trapped, you know, what, what sort of life have they got just swimming around this small tank? And, uh, and some of the other monks said, no, 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 that's not right, that's not right. They said, these, these fish are actually protected from a lot of things that in nature they would have to, uh, have to uh, deal with, you know, like predators, you know, that have other bigger fish that would come and eat them, uh, birds that would come and eat them and so on. And they have to deal with a lack of food perhaps and uh, varying temperatures in the water because of the different seasons. These fish, they get food every day. And if they get sick, maybe <laughs> they even get medicine and so on. And, uh, and, the, and the other monks said, yes, that's true, really, that's true. And in a very real sense, the uh, five precepts, the uh, right action, we've talked about the right action here, that protects us. It's like the aquarium. It sets limits, but it's good for us to know those limits. It's good to have them in mind. One of the great blessings, I think, of the five precepts is that it keeps it in mind for us. You know, I think most people have a basic sense of morality, don't they? Whether they're Christian, whether they're whoever they are. Many people have no religion, and, uh, but they still have a sense of, of uh, ethical behavior. But it's not, it's not uh, something that they're reminded of again and again. And that's the beauty of the five precepts. It reminds us again and again. These are, these are boundaries that we should keep in mind. These are things that we should uh, be careful around. And also, in a very real way, as I say, this is the next point too, one of the points I was going to make, is it's a training of the mind too, to be mindful. Because, as one monk I know points out, mindfulness needs an object. It needs something to be mindful of. <laughs> sometimes we say the present moment, sometimes we say the body, you know, whatever. But one of the most important things to be mindful of, the five precepts. If they're in our minds, it's much, easy, much harder it's much easier to keep them but much harder to break them because they're in our minds and that's why I say it's very nice to be reminded about the five precepts because it comes to mind a lot and even you know I say you know in, in many Buddhist countries uh, particularly in Sri Lanka of course it's something we do as a convention and at that level of course many people just they take it without thinking about it but it is a reminder that Every so often they'll, they'll think, ah, yes, this precept, that precept. So it is useful from that point of view. And sometimes people say, well, what's, what's, the, uh, what's the use of uh, five precepts? What is the, what's the purpose of it? One of the things I'll just touch on here, there's many uses actually, <laughs> is world peace. People often tell, say to me they want to make a contrib contribution to world peace, myself included. And... Uh, and often I used to think, well, you've got to join some organisation that will, you know, promote world peace in, in some very, some way, you know. But I realised as the more I practised that these five precepts, the precepts we keep, they're a contribution to world peace. And in fact, if you, th if you think, you know, what would happen if the whole world were to practise five precepts? Wow, we'd have world peace straight away. <laughs> it's very unlikely to happen. <laughs> So, so, but at least, at the very least, we can think this is my contribution to my own inner peace because we get peace from it too. Because, of course, you know, when you keep the five precepts, you can feel sort of sense of self-respect that you're doing the right thing. You can feel comfortable with yourself and, you know, you're not doing yourself any harm and others any harm. In fact, doing a lot of good for them in many ways. So this is a, our contribution to world peace and a very practical one. Sometimes we think in very, you know, uh, theoretical terms, very abstract terms about world peace. This is very concrete. You know, if we're not harming other beings, killing them, um, if we're not taking things from them, if we're not uh, uh, committing sexual misconduct and lying and also taking alcohol and drugs that cloud the mind, and we see, <laughs> you see the results of that these days in society in a big way. <laughs> so this is a contribution. It's a contribution to peace. 
And a very important part of the, uh, the training in ethical behavior is that it's a, sometimes people don't, we don't appreciate that actually the, the, the power, the strength of refraining from doing something, restraining the mind from doing something. People don't think, they think that's a, a negative, but actually it's something that is very, very useful in our lives, not to act, have to act automatically on everything we see, or we think, everything, every desire that comes up, to be able to be mindful of it and then to have choice not to do it or to do it. You know, you can go either way. So really when we, when we develop the precepts, they're a very good way for us to develop this ability to say no to things. And this is a very important thing in life, not only to, to, our, to our own mind states, but to other people, to situations, to be able to do it, to realize that this is actually for our benefit. And when we do that, we're building up a mental muscle. I'd say it's quite a, a, a real power to be able to um, refrain from doing something, restrain the mind from, from doing something. And I love, Bhante Ji made a very wonderful uh, comment that I really love, that it says, simply refuse to let your anger tell you what to say. I mentioned it last time, last week when I was talking about right speech. So the uh, simply refuse to let your anger tell you what to say. So very, that's wonderful. And when we have that ability to restrain, refrain, we've got choice. So often, you know, when things are really, uh, um, some conditioning is very deep seated, some attachments very strong, you know, our likes, our dislikes, whatever they are, you know, we have very little choice, less and less choice. But the ability to develop this restraint and refraining is very, very useful for our whole lives, for our happiness and well-being. And I was going to move on to to see uh, mention how the uh, the, fi the uh, right uh, right action or the five precepts too, and right livelihood how they become part of the Buddha's path. And of course, to become a Buddhist, the minimum requirement I think actually Buddhism has got the the lowest uh, uh, entry qualification of all the religions, actually. <laughs> is that a good thing? <laughs> I think it is, actually, very open, is that uh, we just have to take refuge in the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, that's all, that's all, to become a Buddhist, you know. And uh, there, there's no other requirement as such. We don't have to particularly believe uh, in, because sometimes people say to me, even in Buddhist countries like Sri Lanka, that, do we have to believe in karma and rebirth? And I say, no, no, you don't have to. But being a Buddhist, you know, if you're a Buddhist, then you'll investigate them at least and have an open mind. So the minimum level is, as I say, to take this, take refuge. And uh, of course, having taken refuge is always consequences. <laughs> if you really believe the Buddha is enlightened, if you really believe the Dhamma is, is a, a very worthwhile teaching, a reflection of the truth, and that the Sangha are those that have realized that truth, then you'll want to put some of it into practice. And of course, what's the first thing to practice? And that's the five precepts. And in this case, the uh, right action. So it's very natural that if you, if you do take refuge, then you want to uh, practice uh, at least ethical behavior. Having said that, most Buddhists in the whole world <laughs> probably don't necessarily keep the five precepts. Uh, they take refuge for sure and they know about the five, five precepts, but whether they keep them, I'm not sure. We have, in every religion, people, there are nominal uh, members as such. They're born into it, but whether they practice it is another thing. They have an affinity for it, and they have a certain amount of knowledge, which is always good, because even if one uh, has taken refuge in the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha and not practicing, at some point in, their, in a person's life, There'll come a time when they, they think, oh, I need to keep the five precepts. There'll come a time when there's difficulties or something come up in their life and they'll realize the values of the, <coughs> the valuable quality of the Buddha's teaching and particularly of sila, of uh, ethical behavior. And as, as I mentioned last week when I was talking about speech, so this is number four and five actually of the, <laughs> of the uh, spokes, uh, that Ethical, uh, ethical behavior, this is uh, right action and uh, right livelihood, 
they come very much from right view and they come very much from right uh, motivation or right attitude. This is the first and second aspects of the Noble Eightfold Path. Because with right view you know, you, well, you, you understand and maybe have some sort of um, experience of it, experiential proof of it, that there are results from our actions of body, speech and mind. And uh, I'd, I don't think it takes Einstein to, to work that one out, actually, especially in our daily lives, to see the results. So when we have that, we, we realize there are consequences, then the, uh, the five precepts or the right action are a natural, natural thing we'll want to follow. Because we know that if we uh, break the five precepts, we will, we will cause, we will uh, create a negative karma, a good, bad karma, as they say, sometimes of an instant nature. <laughs> I think people have an experience of that, of doing something good and getting immediate results and sometimes doing something bad, speaking or acting in some way and getting immediate results from that too. But of course the second aspect of the Noble Eightfold Path, and I mentioned that before, is uh, right uh, motivation or right attitude. So if, you're coming, if we're coming from a right attitude of not trying to get things, to let, let things, let, let go of things, if we're coming from an attitude of non-ill will, of like loving kindness, and we're coming from non-cruelty, like compassion, helpfulness, then very naturally the precepts will follow from that because as I say, they're a great benefit and protection, not only for us, but for other people. <laughs> so it's very, very... Very important. And one of the, the, the big things, as you, can, as you gathered from that, uh, uh, the opening quotation from the Buddha, that, uh, that we, uh, the opening quotation was, here we are, you, you yourselves must strive, the Buddhas only point the way. Those meditative ones who tread the path are released from the bonds of Mara. And of course what that is saying to us, isn't it? And uh, I think we all realize that we have responsibility <laughs> for ourselves. I mean, it's not like the Buddha says, I'm going to walk the path for you, you know, just just believe in me and I'll walk the path for you, I'll do it for you. He cannot do it for you. But what he's done is pointed out the path, pointed out a way that we can practice a path that leads to happiness and well-being, leads to the ultimate happiness and well-being, which is enlightenment. So the, the important thing is to take responsibility and to look inside ourselves. This is to see where we're coming from, to, to see if our... Uh, our behavior by body, speech or mind is, is unwholesome, is negative. And to take responsibility, not to blame others. It's very easy, often we do this actually, is to blame outside things outside us, either people or situations, for some of the things we do and say. Uh, and uh, by that, we sort of feel like it's not our it's not our fault, as it were, it's not our fault. And I like the very nice simile that Ajahn Chah said, this is rather like, he said, when somebody digs a hole and there's a hole and somebody tries to reach something at the bottom of the hole and they can't reach it. And they usually say, what do they usually say? The hole's too deep. But Ajahn Chah said, they never think, what's the other side of you? <laughs> My arm's too short. <laughs> which is looking at my responsibility, but they said, the hole's too deep. But in actual fact, it's the arm that's also too short. It's a bit of a combination, I think, actually. But that's very much taking responsibility for, instead of blaming outside situations, just to realize, you know, that, you know, maybe our arm is too short. <laughs> and that's the reason we're getting into hot water. And that way, too, if we take responsibility, we can do something about it. If we're blaming it onto others and situations outside ourselves, what can you do about that? And not, not so much, actually. You can. So this is very important to, uh, to remember that uh, it's, it's taking responsibility for our actions of body, speech and mind. And knowing that, we cannot rewind them. It's not like a... <laughs> if you used to have film, you could rewind it in videos, perhaps you can wind backwards. You can't take it back when you've done something or said something. People will remember it. And what's more, we remember it too. 
So this is something that uh, is, is essential for ethical behaviour, that we take responsibility for our behaviour of body, speech and mind and see, as I mentioned, that there are consequences of it. But of course, where does it all come from? It comes from the mind, doesn't it? The mind is the forerunner, the Buddha said, of all uh, mental states, all, all wholesome things, all unwholesome things. But the mind is their forerunner. And it very much depends on where we're coming from, our intention. Whether it's coming from greed, hatred or delusion, or coming from non-greed, non-hatred, non-delusion. These things determine, actually, the quality of the karma and that uh, we'll exp we're creating, whether it be positive, good karma, or negative, bad karma. And uh, a very good example, again, I think it's from Ajahn Chah, actually, is somebody washing the dishes, but they've got a scowl on their face and because they're impatient to finish, finish washing the dishes, you know, and... Uh, so it shows that, yeah, they're doing a good thing, but is the mind, uh, is the mind clean? They're cleaning the dishes, but they're not cleaning the mind because the mind has got aversion and I don't want to do this. I want to get out of the way as quick as possible. And Ajahn Shah evidently said, the moment we become averse, negative, the mind goes bad. So this is, is a very good, good point to remember that this is what the whole of you know, when we, when we are practicing ethical behavior, it's not just an external thing, it's a mental thing too. It's very much part of our training the mind. And as I said, that training in refraining, restraining is very important. And it's, a very, it's also a very uh, integral part of the, of the Noble Eightfold Path. Sometimes, as I said last week, you know, right speech, right action and right livelihood can be seen as the unex unexciting <laughs> aspect of the path and oh, not so interesting as right view and uh, also right uh, intention or right motivation, especially not as interesting as right effort and sati, right mindfulness and right samadhi. You know, people think they're the interesting ones. <laughs> but these ones are actually crucial. They're actually crucial. The more I do this series, I realize how essential all of them are actually. And these ones even more because it's a bit like a ladder, isn't it? If you want to get to the top of the ladder, where do you got to start? The bottom of the ladder. If you don't have the rungs at the bottom, you know, if you don't have dana, if you don't have sila, and these very important foundational steps, how are you going to get up? <laughs> this is, and sometimes uh, when we, you know, people practice uh, meditation, they think, that's enough. I don't want to do dana, I don't want to do sila, <laughs> I don't want ethical behavior, and I don't want to develop giving and so on. But of course, the, if they develop the meditation, they will become more sensitive to the fact you need those other things. They're, they're vital, they're, they're uh, as I say, integral. And there's one teaching where the Buddha talks about the fact that the, you know, when we practice ethical behavior, how it leads right to the end of the path. And he says, monks, for a virtuous person, one whose behavior is virtuous, no will need be exerted, let non-regret arise for me. It is natural that non-regret arises in a virtuous person, one whose behavior is virtuous. Non-regret doesn't sound very exciting, but it is just that sense of ha happiness that you know one hasn't harmed oneself or anybody else. And that actually, sometimes uh, um, the Buddha calls that the, the happiness of the blameless, you know, that you can't blame yourself or blame others. You know, you feel very happy. It's actually a very positive thing, but when it's put like that, the Buddha was very scientific. He covered so many things by using the choice of his words, actually. But what he said, it leads automatically. Those Once you've got non-regret, he says that leads automatically, you need not will it, to the arising of joy. He said from that, the arising of rapture. This is piti in Pali, tranquility, pasadi in Pali, happiness, or sometimes Bhikkhu Bodhi translates it as pleasure. I always feel a bit, I don't know, I prefer happiness myself, sukha. And then from this happiness of the mind, which arises naturally because of the preceding qualities, then comes samadhi or stillness of the mind, unification of the mind. And this is where the mind can develop a lot of power, strength and ability to look into things. And then from that, the Buddha says, naturally, we don't have to will it, it will happen. We know and we see things as they truly are. So this is insight, the beginning of insight. And then he says, 
that lead very naturally, you don't have to will it, to disenchantment and dispassion. And this is this turning away from all the external things, all the looking for happiness outside oneself and uh, turning inward to, to the happy, inner happiness. And he said this very naturally leads, one doesn't have to will it, that one doesn't have to make an exertion of will to knowledge and liberation, uh, knowledge and vision of liberation. So this is the end of the path. So this is starting right from the beginning, from sila, from um, ethical behaviour. And it's very important too, uh, um, contemplation. Some people will know sila nusati. And this is sila nusati is contemplating our uh, actions of body, speech and mind that are wholesome, that give rise to a joy in ourselves, that we've done good things, we've said good things and uh, developed good states of mind. And when we get this happiness, we can actually use it in our meditation. We can use it in daily life too. Because, you know, if we feel like we're good people, we've, we've, we're not harming other people, we're doing a lot of good by not uh, harming them, taking their property and so forth, when we have that happiness, it's, it's good in daily life, but it's also very helpful in our meditation. Because as you, as you heard, you know, happiness is a condition for stillness of mind, for unification of mind to happen. So this sila nisati is a very good way to develop that happiness, that inner happiness. And the thing is, when you see the happiness that comes from ethical behaviour, then it, it can become, uh, as I say, an aspect of the meditation which will deepen, deepen it and give it power. And when we get that happiness, we'll do more of it. <laughs> we see the value, more value in it, and so we'll do more of it. And uh, I'd like to, because sometimes people say, and it's a good point, you know, how do you know what is good? <laughs> I think this is very, very crucial. I could ask that for everyone here, actually. How do we know what is good? And these are some of the answers. <laughs> some answers, some, some possibilities. And goodness is what leads to inner happiness, well-being and benefit. And it leads to peace within oneself. Um, so sometimes, uh, um, you know, uh, Breaking sila, you know, doing things, negative things by body, uh, by body or speech, can lead to some very temporary happiness, happiness, but usually leads to also very bad consequences soon after. So you have, for instance, you know, when infidelity in relationships, people may get a small amount of pleasure. This is what the Buddha said: small amount of pleasure, a lot of dukkha, a lot of suffering comes from it. Yes, there is happiness there. But what the Buddha is talking about when we talk about sila, when we talk about ethical behaviour, is that it leads to inner happiness, inner well-being and inner benefit. And I always find, for me, one of the most important ways to, uh, to, uh, to work out if something is, is uh, I should do something or not, say something or not, is to actually just reflect for a moment, would I like to hear this? <laughs> would I like it if somebody did this to me? And this is a very important part of the whole path, that ability to put ourselves in other people's places, to ask that question, would I, would I like to hear this, what I'm about to say to somebody? Would I like to experience what I'm going to do to somebody? And then that very naturally, uh, you know, uh, acts as a, uh, as a good reflection of whether we should do it or not, allows us to uh, refrain from it if, if we think, no, no, I, w I wouldn't like to hear this, I would like to, s to have this done to me. And it very much also ties into something that we all have, and that's a sense of conscience. And the Buddha called this uh, hiriotapa, hiriotapa, often translated as shame, and a fear of fear of the consequences of our actions, both by body speech and uh, body speech and mind, because these the, the Buddha called were the guardians of the world, and whether people are Buddhists, Christians, or whatever, or no religion, most people have a natural sense of conscience, don't they? They do know. Some people are very good overriding that, <laughs> but. People do have an idea of what is, you know, acceptable and what isn't, what is good and what isn't good. They have a basic idea. And there's a lovely story that, uh, again, Ajahn Brahm tells, and it's from the commentaries, I think, and many of you will know this story, of a teacher 
I think he was supposed to be in Taxila, which is modern Pakistan. And he had all these students, he was quite famous, he had all these students and, uh, and he was a renowned teacher. But he also had a very beautiful daughter, <laughs> at least one daughter. And it came to the time when she was uh, ready to get married. And so he said to his uh, <coughs> students, his disciples, you could call them actually too, that whoever does what I ask of you <coughs> can have my daughter's hand in marriage. And this is what he asked them. He said, I want you, this is very interesting, I want you to go into the village and uh, steal as much as you can, but no, nobody should see you stealing. Nobody should, <coughs> if they see you stealing, that's the end of it. Well, of course it will be the end of it. <laughs> so I'll put him in prison. So no, he's out of there. And the, and the student that has stolen the most at the end of one week, one week, will have my daughter's hand in marriage. Great, isn't it? <laughs> Good qualities. And so these, these um, uh, students, these disciples of this teacher, went into the village every night and stole this and that as much as they could and, and no doubt had to store it somewhere back at the teacher's place. And at the end of the week, the teacher came and had a look at the, and asked them what they'd stolen and they, they all told him, you know, I've got this and I've got that and, and they, all, they all went through. And he got to the, one of the last students, he said, what have you stolen? He said, he said, I, I didn't steal anything, actually. He said, why didn't you steal anything? He said, because there was someone watching. And he said, who, who was watching? He said, I was watching. <laughs> so this is his sense of conscience, isn't it? We all have that, in a sense. We're watching. So we know, you know, when something, you can tell when something is not very wholesome, you've got a very uncomfortable feeling. Oh, I don't think I should do this. So... That was a really, really good, good story that brings that home, that we have that sense of conscience, that we are watching, we do know uh, what we're doing. Sometimes we have, and you see it, it's very much in our society too, that, uh, you know, if, you, if nobody knows, you can get away with doing it. So if nobody knows you're evading a tax, you know, it's okay, you know, or if nobody knows whatever you're doing, the negative thing you're doing. But of course, we know, we know, so this is a, and who do we have to live with? Ourselves. <laughs> so whether anybody else knows it is, is not the point. Because when we know uh, that we've done something uh, and said something uh, uh, that's not good or been thinking things that are not good, we have to live with it. We have to live with ourselves. And that reverberates and that means that we can't have really inner happiness, inner peace and inner well-being at all. And as I mentioned too, that uh, because of cause and effect too, uh, very much we know that good gives rise to good results and uh, bad gives rise to uh, unfortunate results. Sometimes people will of course say, as, a, as they often do, I've seen people do things, bad things, and they haven't got the, the results. But the only thing one can say is, not yet. <laughs> not yet, but they will they will get the results in one way or another, they come. And of course, uh, as I mentioned, we can dilute our negative karma by doing something of uh, good, something of the opposite nature. So if there's been killing of living beings, for instance, if we give life to living beings, someone was asking me, I did a memorial service the other day for someone who uh, died at 34, and I was saying, you know, one of the, the things that is often recommended for extending life. Uh, he had an accident, so he had no choice about this. He was killed by a car while he was walking on a road in Sri Lanka. Uh, one of the things we can do to extend life is give life. However, you know, save, save beings, insects, animals, from death, from dying. Because no being wants to die. Usually don't, they don't want to die. So this is one way, and of course in Sri Lanka there's many people who will save, uh, say for instance, cows from slaughter, release fish, into rivers and release birds and so on. Sometimes this can be a bit of a racket. <laughs> the birds are released, yes, then they come back and then, <laughs> then they're released again and they come back. <laughs> so, but nevertheless, the person, you could say, the person who was doing it had a good intention, but if they realize it's just a racket, then you know, it does rather change it. But of course, one of the, one of the biggest uh, things that tells us what's good is mindfulness, isn't it? 
Because if we're really present with what we're doing and saying, we, we know to a very large degree how we feel. We can get a feeling from, from uh, what we're doing and saying, a very unpleasant feeling if it's negative and, uh, and a happy feeling if we, it's a positive thing. So mindfulness is always good. And we can, it makes it the possibility of keeping the precepts much easier. It, uh, it's, it's something that's always... The Buddha said we can never have too much of, isn't it? <laughs> you can't, can't have too much of mindfulness. And especially when it's con combined with what we call clear awareness, we know what's going on around us. We know the context that we are mindful in. Sometimes people can be mindful, be in the present moment, but not be aware of the context of what's going on around them. This is called sampajanya, and that's very important too. To, to realize the context we're in. But I always come back to, you know, uh, Venerable, um, the Buddha's advice to Venerable Rahula about what, was, uh, what, was, what is good and what isn't good. And he was talking in particular about, uh, he was talking about body, speech and mind, but it, the reason for him speaking to his son, Venerable Rahula, was because of lying. And if the Venerable Rahula had told a lie, he was only seven years old, <laughs> <laughs> because he'd tell this lie that it, uh, they'd say, is the Buddha here at the, this monastery? And he'd say, no, he's not here. <laughs> that sort of thing, you know, as kids will do. So then the Buddha gave this lovely teaching, which is just beautiful, the, the, the way he did it, you know. Just taking a, 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 you know the story? He takes a, because his son, when he comes, his son gives him a, a, a container of water to wash his feet. And he, and he washes his feet with it. And, uh, you know, he throws the water away and he says, you know, just as... You know, this, uh, I've thrown this water away. So someone who uh, can tell a deliberate lie has thrown away goodness, has thrown away the holy life. And just as this is empty now, someone who can tell a deliberate lie is empty of, of the qualities of a, a spiritual person and so on. He just used this very simple, um, simple, and he turned it upside down. He said, it's just in the same way, someone who, who can tell a lie is turned upside down the spiritual life. And he really brought the point, point home in a very natural way, actually, it's lovely. But he said to uh, Venerable Rahula, his son, that he can tell if something was good or bad. If, it's, if it doesn't, if something is good, it won't harm, he says, it doesn't harm oneself, it doesn't harm others, or it doesn't harm both. So this is a very good test for, uh, if something is good, you know, it doesn't harm anybody. And of course, if it does harm oneself or others, and you know, mm, not to be done. <laughs> Even if there's something to be gained out of it, you know, sometimes people will do a lot for money or, or for praise or whatever. And also to check up, the Buddha said to his son, check up on where you're coming from, the motivation. Is it wholesome or unwholesome? This is a very good way to know, you know, where we're coming from. If it's coming from a negative mind state, then we know this is not going to lead to good results. But if it's coming from a wholesome one, then no problem, can go ahead with this. And then, of course, the, the Buddha being almost like a scientist, he said we should check out the results of what we do and say, and even think, and see if they have pleasant consequences or painful consequences. And of course, that, is, that, is a, that will test it immediately, you know, whether it was a good thing or it wasn't. Sometimes we can think, yes, it's a good thing. <laughs> then the consequences come out and we think, oh no, and maybe it wasn't a good thing after all. So, so the, there are some of the ways that we can you know, uh, determine what is good and what isn't good. And as I say, oneself as a measuring stick and a sense of conscience, very helpful. And remember the student, <laughs> the student who didn't steal anything and I didn't end the story. The teacher gave his daughter's hand in marriage to him because <laughs> he was the only one that was really practicing what the teacher was really uh, concerned with. So that's a really good point. And the method for doing this, of course, is, as I say, you know, keeping the five precepts, the eight precepts, 10 precepts or 220 precepts, 311 precepts for nuns. So 227 for monks, five precepts, are like a, a, a daily practice we can take for daily practice or particular occasions. Eight precepts are usually taken when a person comes to a, a monastery on the full moon days. That's often when people do it. Or even on the new moon days, they can do it then too. And then 227 precepts, that's for monks 
the Bhikkhu Sangha and the 311 for nuns. And there's a very amusing story that I heard, I think from Venerable Dhammika. This, this evidently does happen in Sri Lanka. I've seen it happen actually, but, but this one's quite good actually. It takes it even further. That sometimes people will go for the full moon, uh, the poya they call it, the full moon observance, at a monastery or a pansala temple. They will take, maybe they will take 10 precepts in the morning and then, uh, then they will take in the uh, ten precepts means you're not using money. You won't use money, and uh, that you won't eat food in the afternoon. That you won't uh, wear adornments or perfumes, those sorts of things. And you won't lie on high beds or luxurious beds. And as I say, you won't use money. And then in the afternoon they might take eight precepts, and it's eighteen. And then just before they go home, five precepts, <laughs> so they can go home and have dinner. <laughs> He says, you can get 23 precepts in one day. <laughs> That's pretty good. It's not pretty good because, of course, taking them, I always say to people, taking them is one thing, but keeping them is the power. That's where, where the, the good karma is. So 23 in one day is pretty good. I think actually mostly, mo main, most people would, could get up to 13, actually, because they'll take eight for the day, and then when they're just about to go home, the monk will give them five precepts, got 13. So... <laughs> But of course, you know, and, and I always think of Bhante Jeeves, he's a Sri Lankan monk who lives in America. He's always very strong and he said, no, 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 it's for, you keep them till the next dawn. <laughs> so he's probably not popular. So, so this is, a, and as I say, the, the precepts, uh, we know the first precept. I'll read out a little bit and so we can finish off fairly soon. Uh, yes, yes, I'll just... Now, I might just mention this in brief, actually. But of course, the precepts can be developed on two levels. The re level of restraint or refraining, you know, obviously, if we're not harming uh, living beings, if we're not destroying life, the destruction of life, as it is mentioned, we can have compassion and loving kindness. We can develop those. Always in the, in the Buddha's uh, the way of looking at it, there's two sides. And one is to avoid or to abandon the negative, the unwholesome, uh, with, uh, whether it be by speech, uh, by, by bodily action, or by mind, to abandon it. The other side is to develop the positive, to develop positive qualities that are wholesome. And in many ways, when we develop the wholesome, the negative is abandoned. You know, you, you don't have much room for them. So when we develop loving kindness and compassion, we're abandoning the, the possibility of destroying life, of harming other beings. It's very unlikely, if we're coming from loving kindness, that we'll flip into <laughs> destroying something. So this is a very good point to, to think that the precepts, the precepts, I call them a minimum level. If we, if we keep the precepts, it's a great gift to others, but it also protects us. But there's also the other, other level is of the, uh, practicing the uh, positive, as it were, the wholesome side. And, of course, you know, when we don't harm living beings and uh, not destroying life, these five wrong livelihoods are a good example of things that hurt um, ourselves because it's bad karma and hurt others. So we have here, you know, trade in living beings. And this can include, these days, people trafficking. They're very big, isn't it? Prostitution. Um, some of these... Uh, uh, well, that's tra people, people trafficking when they um, kidnap children for adoption. This happens in China, kidnap children for organs, organs, live organs. It's terrible. It's just incredible. Uh, and uh, also uh, trades that are to do with the meat industry and intoxicants and weapons and poisons. Those, those, those things harm other beings and actually when you think about them, it's very natural. You can see, yes, they do harm other beings. Um, and also, when we have the precept of refraining from not taking what's given, the opposite is generosity, isn't it? Giving. And this is a great quality, dana, we call it in Pali, to uh, develop. And the, the opposite of, um, I might mention this in a little bit of detail because it's often uh, cloudy, sexual misconduct, the opposite the positive side we can develop is, of course, contentment, reliability, and dependability. Those are really uh, important qualities to have in a relationship. Because like business, like uh, all relationships, whether they be business, personal relationship, 
they all hinge on, what do they hinge on? Trust. Yep, once the trust is gone, poof, it's, it's difficult, it's difficult. So I'll just read out what the Buddha says, because often people, when we say sexual misconduct, they often say, well, what is that? <laughs> it's a bit of an umbrella term. And uh, this one is quite a, this, it gives a little bit of detail here. And uh, it says here, this is what the Buddha said, having abandoned sexual misconduct, you abstain from sexual misconduct. You do not have sexual relations with those who are under age, under the age of consent, so that's number one. Uh, with those who are unable to give consent, for instance, like being uh, disa mentally disabled persons who are not free to refuse consent. And uh, the example I'm given here is such as a student and a teacher. This is a very, a very serious breach of, uh, of trust and uh, uh, this, uh, sexual misconduct. Uh, and where such con uh, conduct would break, uh, would be breaking a law. That's, that's quite important too. Um, or even when, uh, or even with one already engaged, that's the last one, somebody who's engaged to, in a relationship, engaged um, perhaps to get married or whatever. So this is very, these are, that's, that's quite a good summary of it because people, people often say to me, what is sexual misconduct? <laughs> we usually say adultery, but, but it's more than that, more than that. And so, I'm perhaps getting close to the end, so now just maybe f to uh, to mention this one, another quote from the Buddha. And, and this puts the value of the five precepts of sila, of ethical behavior, very much uh, uh, gives, gives, us, gives a, a very good understanding of it, the value of it. By abstaining from the destruction of life, etc., the noble disciple gives an immeasurable number of beings freedom from fear, fear from enmity and affliction. He himself or she herself in turn enjoys immeasurable freedom from fear, enmity, this is like hatred, and affliction, like suffering, like pain, harm. This is the first gift, a great gift. And he's talking each of the five precepts is a great gift, uh, a pristine gift, uh, something very, very important. And how many people think of it <laughs> like that as a gift? So, let's see. Now. So just to finish off uh, almost, let's see. And what are the benefits of uh, right, uh, right action, right livelihood, these two uh, aspects, the Noble Eightfold Path? In the present life, the Buddha said, you'll gain wealth because people will trust you, it will be reliable, and, and as such, it's much easier to gain wealth, to, to gain a living. He said you also have a good reputation, um, that people will respect you, they have a good reputation. You'll be able to respect yourself too. <laughs> That's very important. And uh, you'll have confidence and assurance wherever you go, when you, when you meet with people, groups of people. And he said also one who has uh, developed ethical behaviour dies unconfused. And I also mentioned self-respect and it can be used for the meditation practice to develop wisdom. It's a gift of peace to the world. <laughs> That's very important and harmony in the family, in society, to the world. And in the future, future lives, it can give, give rise to happy rebirth, fortunate destinations. And of course the ultimate uh, purpose of ethical behaviour too is to support the practice that leads to Nibbāna, to, the, to the, the goal of the Noble Eightfold Path. And this is, as I always mentioned, is highest happiness. This is, the Buddha praised as the highest happiness. And I haven't touched very much on uh, right livelihood, but it's very much informed by the principles that I've mentioned before, which is that we shouldn't harm uh, ourselves or others. And uh, so we shouldn't engage in the uh, five uh, types of trade that do that. And that doesn't lead to breaking the precepts, our jobs. It's very important, you know, sometimes with the right livelihood, people think it's just a minor part of the path, but we spend, people spend a lot of time at work. This is a really important part. Time-wise, it's really big, and also it's where we can actually um, uh, 
cause a lot of good karma to happen or bad karma create. So it's very important that we do uh, those sorts of. Uh, we have the we have a clear understanding of whether it is help is breaking the five precepts. It's helping our spiritual growth or not. So I think I think we can just finish there and just as I say, the uh, most important things is this is a great benefit to ourselves and to others. And we, we, we should see that it can be a source of joy, happiness, and the happiness of the blameless. So I encourage myself and everyone else <laughs> to develop Sila. Maybe we will be like uh, Silawa, the venerable Silawa, whose verses I mentioned at the beginning, you know, and we'll, we'll really see the value of, of keeping ethical behaviour and see the results of it for ourselves in this very life and that it will lead to the end of suffering, it lead to the highest happiness, Nibbāna. So I'd like to finish with those few words and thank you very much for coming this morning. So, there we are.